I've been in and out and in and out the scene from the early days from this thing called Rear Groove. You had to choose between being a rebel or a soul head as it was called back in my day. I heard James Brown, I heard Aretha Franklin, I heard Fela Kute. It was just London. We'd go up to Manchester and hear records that came from America but had a totally different style. And what we were interested in, who created it? Our view of music, it wasn't Rear Groove, it was new and we wanted to find out where it came from, who created it, who the producers were, who the bass player were. And then we'd trace the musicians back to early albums and find out they were doing jazz albums. And then they were doing straight ahead jazz albums. And we got into jazz. So that gave another avenue to our music listening and our dance capability. So we'd seek out clubs that played the kind of music that we wanted, that was different, that was innovative, that had a slightly different edge. Funk to me, hearing it from my dad and hearing Roy Ayers, Ubiquity, which was talking about black progression. Roberta Flack speaking to me, enabling me, changing my mind, giving me greatest lessons than I ever got from school, than I ever got from a book. It has to affect not just my dance, my body moving to it, but my mind and my soul and my spirit. And so if I wanted to, in a sense, give a name to Rear Groove, it has to have that encapsulated in it. The other thing I find really interesting about my remembrance of days of clubbing was the conflict. And which is interesting, I was North London. We'd go to Lyceum, there'll be South London, there'll be West London, there'll be East London, and there were fights. And those days, thank God, are gone. But that's how I remember it. And I remember days of being in the club and having a knife up my throat for knocking a man's brandy out of his hand. You know, in a way, that's the truth. And that's what I want to say when we talk about Rear Groove. It's interesting, Rear Groove are here bandied around by loads of DJs. I just think if we're going to talk about the club, the music, we have to talk about holistically. But the meaning to me has more importance than what people give it. To me, it was instruction, it was freedom, it was enablement. Music for me, which is Rear Groove, doesn't just represent music in itself. It represents a battle. It represents a identity. It represents affirmation of who black people are music and what we have to say and how we want to say it. And that is another important aspect of Rear Groove that is really important to me. I'd love you just to, first of all, introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Jeffrey. I've been in and out and in and out the scene from the early days from this thing called Rear Groove. I mean, I'm controversial in the fact that Rear Groove is a name that I will use because people will understand what I mean by that. But coming from Stoke Newton as I did, growing up in the era of Dalston and sound systems, being younger, when in my school it was a choice. You had to choose between being a rebel or a soul head as it was called back in my day in Hackney Down. Being a musician, I was in a marching band with um, a couple of other friends who were with me and we uh, progressed from that to wanting to create the music that we heard. Hearing sound system, growing up with sound system, but my dad was a drummer. And so I heard James Brown, I heard Aretha Franklin, I heard Fela Kute, and these were my mum and dad's records. I wasn't allowed to touch them, but they were touched. And they touched me and they're in me. So although I grew up in Stone Newton, with sound system, dub plate, hosting was the, how can I put it, the key of the day. There were many people in my school who were into soul just like I was. And we were soul heads. And the first club I remember going to was Rorty Southgate. Being in a marching band, we weren't allowed out late, but we could go to band competitions and come back late. So we transpired to create the story that we had a band competition when Rorty Southgate was on and we'd go up with our band uniform, put on our t-shirts, red striped trousers, everybody wanted to know where we got it from and we'd hit the dance floor. And that was me at the age of 14, hearing music. Being a creator of music it was different for us because when we heard music, the first thing we would do is go down the West End stores and everybody knows the record stores that were there in the day around Soho and we'd go to Piccadilly, we'd meet other musicians who we knew and they were creating bands at the same time as we were. There was a lot of interaction between the bands. Central Line, Camille, Head Defoe, Second Image, 
light of the world. We were produced by the same producer. My first record was produced. And we go clubbing and we go to lots of different clubs. And being a musician, I got to travel the country. So it wasn't just London. We'd go up to Manchester and hear records that came from America but had a totally different style. And what we were interested in, who created it? Who were the musicians in it? Because we wanted to create music ourselves. So our view of music, it wasn't rear groove, it was new. And we wanted to find out where it came from, who created it, who the producers were, who the bass player were. And so we had our favorite bands being into funk. And then we'd trace the musicians back to early albums and find out they were doing jazz albums. And then they were doing straight ahead jazz albums. And we got into jazz. And so that gave another avenue to our music listening and our dance capabilities. And so we'd seek out clubs that played the kind of music that we wanted, that was different, that was innovative, that had a slightly different edge. Funk, to me, hearing it from my dad and hearing Roy Ayers, Ubiquity, which was talking about black progression. I come from the era of Stevie Wonder, Donna Hathaway speaking to me, Roberta Flack speaking to me, enabling me, changing my mind, giving me the greatest lessons than I ever got from school, than I ever got from a book. So music was key. And it wasn't just me, there were fellow people who grew up with this music genre, who wanted it, who wanted to go clubbing and wanted to not just dance, but be elevated beyond that. And it's interesting when we talk about music and DJs are talking about rear groove, it seems to be that they're enabling themselves by trying to acquire music that wasn't easily accessible. And that's what they thought was rear groove. But to me, it's a greater essence than that. It has to affect not just my dance, my body moving to it, but my mind and my soul and my spirit. And so if I wanted to, in a sense, give a name to Rear Groove, it has to have that encapsulated in it. And for me, I think that's missed. And the other thing I find really interesting about my remembrance of days of clubbing was the conflict. And what is interesting, I was North London. We go to Lyceum, there'll be South London, there'll be West London, there'll be East London, and there were fights, and there were instances I don't want to go into, but there were some severe incidents that I remember, and I don't recall from hearing about it, I was there. And it's interesting, that element has gone out, and we can look back fondly, and as you do, you always remember the best bit. But that was a vast element of clubbing. Still to this day, I go out and I don't drink, and I don't imbibe, I'm always on my toes, and those days, Thank God are gone, but that's how I remember it. And I remember days of being in the club and having a knife up my throat for knocking a man's brandy out of his hand. A little reggae brethren standing there in the middle of the floor, not dancing, who got caught by my towel and wanted to make me a victim for his drink coming out of his hand. Those are the days I remember. And that's part of it. And you know, in a way, that's the truth. And that's what I want to say when we talk about rear groove. There are lots of elements to it. There were creators of music who were affected. There was loads of people who went clubbing who became musicians and wanted to form bands. And we have a very different relationship. And to me, it's interesting, Rear Groove are here, banded around by loads of DJs. But to me, it's more than what was acquired on venue that you had that nobody else had. It's about the musicians, where they came from. Is it Atlanta? Was it Philly? Was it Minneapolis? Was it Dayton, Ohio, where funk bands come from? We were all into that. We wanted to understand why there was a difference in the music that we were receiving. And that to me is the most important part. And when I go back today and I'm clubbing, I'm hearing music that I remember. And I remember in specific clubs where I heard, heard it in. Studio 21 was always a club where I heard African Bambata. I heard music played that was slightly off field. And that then went all the way to Covent Garden African Centre and I followed through on that. So my musical journey in Clubland was various, uh, different parts of the country. I learned very early on that the music I heard in clubs of London was interpreted differently in different parts of the country. And I could hear records that I would hear in Manchester that I heard in London five years later. And so that was really interesting to me. And I just think if we're gonna talk about the club, the music, we have to talk about holistically. Yeah. You've got to remember, having been signed and having, knowing how record companies are, they will use a tag to market to us. And every time a new genre is created, 
that was created naturally, a name is giving it to us so the public know where to find it and so they can market it to us. So I'll accept rear green because I know what most people make it mean, but the meaning to me has more importance than what people give it. To me, it was instruction, it was freedom, it was enablement, it was me as a black London and seeing black musicians create music with lyrics of wonder, with lyrics of elevation. And that's what I look for now, and that's what I hear today. Well, that was absolutely amazing, because I didn't actually ask you any questions, and you've summed up the whole scene. But what I'd like to do, I'd just like to take you through a couple of the points that you made, because you've raised some really, really interesting points. Now, first of all, just so everybody knows, um, I've just met you at Poetic Funk, yep. and you were busting moves on the dance floor. Yep like you were 14 and <laughs> first of all can you give me your uh, your age just to give well, the context I, I, well i'm 60 all right i'm 61 this year and so it's interesting to me when i went clubbing i remember men of my age or younger than my age actually 50 coming clubbing we wonder what the hell are you doing here and here i am at the age of 60 still doing it the music means the same thing to me as it did then nothing's changed in fact the music's taken great importance and so when I go to clubs now, if I hear it, I have to tear it. I have to do it on the floor, just like I did back in the day. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is the untold story of yeah. Rare Groove, as you know, because um, you came up to me in the club and um, you said you were going to be controversial. And well, I mean, when I say controversial, I've always been interested in what the record companies do. Having been signed twice, having been signed at the age of 18 with Red Bus Records and then signed by Virgin having an album deal, I know that what they want to do to the public is to create a marketable product and for me i wasn't interested in that i was interested in the artists the genre of the music that i were into were created by musicians and it was a real it was organic it wasn't contrived it wasn't done i mean the terms if you speak to many musicians who are my age who were into the music and you say things like acid jazz if you said weird goods two-step and all the things that i've heard so far they weren't genres that were in our mind. We knew what music was and we knew the artists and it was the artists that we were interested in. They had a character and what we were looking for is their character in the music. The definitions were unimportant. The artists were key. Maybe that's a personal view for the musicians, but I'm sure the musicians that I knew and I grew up with would have the same concept, you know. So. So yeah, I mean, this is what I'm fascinated in. And the reason why I'm using the word rare groove mm -hmm. is because I'm using it as an all-encompassing term yes. for what I call magical, syncopated, yes. organic music. Yes. And any music that comes under that umbrella, um, I just feel, you know, it, it's different. It's got a, an element that brings the dancers to the dance floor. Yes. So although I'm defining it yes. and helping to define it, yes. I feel that it needs to be defined because it rare groove sets itself apart from other styles of music that are more like four to the floor. Yeah. So what is it that draws you as a dancer to the floor when you hear rare groove? Well, it's interesting. Having been involved in trying to create music and had the same effect upon people as had on me when I've heard music. The most important thing is for musicians, musicians to come together and strive to create an identity in their music. I'll give you an example. I remember hearing bands back in the day when I first went clubbing. And there's certain bands that had such a distinctive sound that today when I hear them, I still go, wow, that band, like Slave. You hear a Slave record and you know it's a Slave record. You hear Mr. Adams on the bass, and you hear an identity that you didn't get from other bands. So, although people are defining their grooves, it needs refinement, because within that genre, there are elements of music which have 4-4 four, four in it. I dispute whether 4-4 four, four is a defining or syncopation, because there's lots of music that we call real groove that has 4-4 four, four in it. I'm being a percussionist and I'm being real about that because I understand about rhythm. But there's something more than that. There's an honesty in it. There's an uncontrivedness about rear groove, okay? It's organic, it's creation. It's creation created by bands, guys who went to school together. Take Prince, and you look at his bands, 
and you look at who was involved in it in his early days. That was organic creation created from Minneapolis, a town where black musicians were here in rock and they grew up here in pop music. And you can hear that their funk is different from other bands, like bands that came from Dayton, Ohio. And that's huge. I'm into funk and Dayton, Ohio had a vast presence in music, in funk. And lots of people who are into funk know about Dayton, Ohio and how many bands came out of that. And that has an organic identity. And then you have Philly music, which is still another identity. So within Weird Groove, and when I hear it, I hear music from Brazil. I hear Fede Kute, Nigerian music. All that music is organic and honest. It's not contrived. It's not dominated by the producer. The producers in the arrangement were producing and arranging music that was already created, rather having a dominance like we hear in dance music today. And that's key. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned was the Africa Centre. I yes. don't know whether you know my history, yes. but I was instrumental in setting up the Africa yeah. Centre, promoting and yeah. DJing there. Yes. Um, take people back to that moment, because part of this untold story is to is to talk to the dancers like yourself mm -hmm. who are actually on the dance floor yeah. so we can bring that um we can bring it alive through the oral history well funny thing is you know when i remember going to african center and clubs like studio 21 one of the things that was interesting the only college of fashion was just down the road in oxford street there was a lot of people who were into design and clothes and that's still present today i still see it when i go out now and there was a lot of black identity in black clothing and black iconic dress in those clubs and people were going there to not only dance and relate to music that was interesting but to show their identity through their clothes it wasn't just dance actually it was a combination of factors and there was a lot of enablement and black consciousness and a black identity about enabling ourselves and lifting ourselves which is quite different from a lot of the dance music now which is rather than elevating us out of the gutter is putting us there and then when i go to clubs i want to be elevated i want to be transformed i want to be drawn towards the light you know and that's what i get from the music that i remember you know when i think of all the bands there is a constant that goes through those bands you know right from the music that was popular even in the pop world that would cr cross over to the pop world it was enabling yeah it wasn't disabling music and when i come out here although i go away tired and exhausted and rinsed and i go to the chiropractor i go elevated and the djs that i follow do that too and they know that you know you can hear the records and you can hear how the records follow and you can hear the information given in that record and how djs will listen and try to get a record that will project from that you can hear the journeys and that's another thing about djs who play the kind of music that I into. They know the music as well as I do. So you've touched upon something that I always talk about, which is the ride. Yeah. You've, you've called it the journey, but yeah. as a DJ, it's the DJ's function to take the dance floor on a ride. Yeah. And it's painting, you know, the, the dark, the, you talked about the light. Yeah. Um, so I find that fascinating that, you know, as a dancer, you've analysed it so much because a lot of people, you know, they've come to a club, they come in the club, they go home exhausted. But not everyone understands that the DJs are working hard to take the, to take the, um, the dance floor on a, on a ride. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the purpose of a DJ. I mean, I go back and I was talking to some of my musician friends and we remember going to clubs where a DJ would play a record that we did not like. That would lead to bottles being thrown. And it was really interesting. I was talking about how it changed where the DJs became more dominant in music and then became so dominant that they started to create music, which is an interesting phenomenon in itself. And about the transformation from DJ to mixing to remixing to creating the music and what that had and what the effects have had upon music and that but that's just an element about music but the music that i'm hearing in the past wasn't done that way it was bands it was musicians you know and that's the key thing you know when i listen to records i'll hear records and i start to remember oh that bass player also was in that band oh that bass player became a producer or i'll hear a drummer and realize the drummer went on to produce norman connors how many singers who are drummers who were drummers 
Marvin Gaye, Teddy Pendergrass and they're going through all those. So I was a creator of music. So when I listen to music and music affects me mentally and shifts me, I wanted to do music and I want to do that in my own way. And so I listen to music on a deep level. But lots of people who are in that club are receiving it equally, whether they're creating it or not. And I think a lot of people are here because that's what music means to them. I often call coming to a club like this church and I mean it. You know, you can see that unity, you can see a record come on. I can hear the bass line immediately you know the chords that are coming. I hear the chords. I look at the people and immediately the DJ's looking at them too and they know they've got them. And you can see the DJ go, yeah, that was the right record to play after that record I just played. And I know they've done it too. And even though I know they've done it, they still do it to me. And that, it takes some skill, yeah. And the, and the music, which we will call Rear Groove, for want of a better title, has that effect upon people. People don't come out of here feeling depressed. You know, it is enlightening. It's uplifting. Yeah, it's uplifting and it's moving. And it's transformative as well. It enables you. There's information in those records, which is, if you're not in that place, you hear it and you strive for it. You've mentioned the Africa Centre. Yeah. And what I've asked people to do is to walk through um, arriving at the Africa Centre, or even getting ready for the Africa yeah. Centre. So I'd love, a, I'd love you to bring that alive for... Uh, the untold story. Well, it'll probably be from the night before rehearsing, trying to write a song or come up with a new tune that we'll be working on. We'd wake up tired and think, hey, let's go down to the African Centre. But it, was, it wasn't just going out clubbing, it was research. <laughs> we knew that the African Centre would give us music that was different and divergent from the other clubs we were going to. So we were getting new angles in music. We were getting new edges that we could hear there. And the people that went there too were also looking for that. And I was a bit, in, back in the day, I was into clothes as well. And I liked the style. I liked the energy of the people going there. And the people that went there were slightly different. They had a different aspect to it. It wasn't like a normal club. It was like, it, I can't explain it. It was like you knew it was different and you went there to see people who knew it was different. It had an edge to it. Yeah, and it wasn't a negative edge, it was just an edge. It was just slightly different from the rest of the clubs that I remember going to. What were the, some of the tracks you heard there for the first time? Well, the, the, the tracks that we were hearing was stuff like African Bambata. It's stuff like, you know, hearing Fun Boy Free played in those kind of tracks, which you would not ordinarily hear in other clubs. So for me, it was widening my listening. Yeah, yeah. yeah? So that's what I liked. And it took dance to a level that you knew dance could be many things and it didn't have to remain in one aspect of dance alone. And you could take in different cultures and ascribe it to the culture that exists and make something new. You know, that's what I remember. Mainly. So I want to also pick you up on something you, you talked about and uh, I mentioned the syncopation. Now, as a musician, you yeah. understand what syncopation yeah. is. Yeah. Um, for people who might not actually know what the word is, um, could you give us um, an explanation of what syncopation is and, okay. and, and what, how it fits into rare groove as opposed to other types of music? Well, it's interesting. When you look at where music has gone to, so I call... The term dance music is interesting. It means that you can go and you can move to it. <laughs> but dance music to me is not dance music. Syncopation is the ability to take a time and add other accents to it that give a different definition than leading on four or one or three of a beat. You're altering the beat and that allows dancers to move in a different way and still find time. So musicians love playing with time and that's why I went to clubs that did music that had that element in it. Okay, so, so that's what you attracted you yeah, to, what I'm calling yeah. rare groove, which yeah. is syncopated yeah. organic yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's interesting, you, I'll go further, and it's interesting that I go further in this way. Rear Groove to me is music of black origin that was not the music that was designed to appeal to the greater population. And that might sound a weird way of putting it. So it was definitely focused on black identity and black references rather than the appeal. It wasn't what we call Motown, <laughs> okay? It wasn't Motown, it wasn't that music which widened it appeal. It was definitely music of black origin with black focus, with black issues being spoken about. 
And that, to me, is another important element of rear view. Well, yeah, I thank you very much. Now, look, this is the untold story. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone I interview, I ask them to give me a nugget or something that's never been told. And um, as I said, when you approached me at the club, you had a little twinkle in your eye as if to say, there are things I want to say, yeah. but I can't say on camera. But I would love you because, as I said, this is a platform for telling the story okay. in, in the 360. OK, well, well, I'll I tell you a story which was interesting. OK, I was in one band, um, had a two record deal, and that was interesting. On my first foray, I wrote, I was a lyricist. We were a band that wrote together and we had a publishing deal and we put records out and it did reasonably well. Uh, we had a couple of years of hiatus, me and the bass player Sammy together. Sammy wanted to get another band and so we went and got other musicians. And we ended up performing at Ronnie's for a number of record companies and we got signed to Virgin, who had a publishing deal with us as well. So we were in the boardroom being signed, which was interesting. And I remember having a conversation, it went like this. At the time, I think Loose End was the first band Virgin had with black music reference that was popular, that had been successful, and they wanted to get other bands. And we were to be the next aligned on the Chitral train track to make more money for them. But what was, as, sorry, what's the name of your band? Um, it was LW5. So, as we were signing, Simon Draper, <laughs> head of Virgin Music, said a very interesting comment in my earshot. He said, I will don't understand me, black music and I never will. And I was dumbfounded. I went, I asked him, I said, um, do you like Rolling Stone? And he went, yeah, yeah. I said, you like Cream? And he went, yeah. Oh, you like King Crimson? Well, I'm just checking, you know, I wanted to see it. And he went, yeah, I go, that's music of Black Origin, by the way. That's our music. I was told by the other members to shut my mouth. We were supposed to be signing a contract. And I, in that moment, I really had an understanding of why I liked the music, which I liked. Okay, it, music for me, which is rear groove, doesn't just represent music in itself. It represents a battle. It represents a identity. It represents affirmation of who black people are music and what we have to say and how we want to say it and that is another important aspect of rear grooves that is really important to me and i think other people like me feel the same way as well well it's been absolutely fascinating is there anything that you you'd like to document um at this point i would love to do a follow-up interview because what i find is that um having talked to people when they watch these back so much more comes up yeah, that they I mean, say interesting. i mean for me, when I saw you and I've been watching it, I spoke to a couple of people and I said, there's a couple of some points I wanted to get at. I've managed to get most of them. There are details I could go into. But I really do think it's important that Rear Groove is not just a, a commodity. It's more than that. Yeah. yeah. It's what represents us. Yeah, when we're in there, when we're feeling that music, and anybody who feels it, whether you're black or white, Indian, whether you're Australian, that doesn't matter. But what matters is you recognise what it is and where it came from. Props to the people that brought it, and that's us. Yeah, well, one, one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this is I feel um, that the, the narrative has been distorted. And I feel that the people who have created what I call you know, the urban myth about Rare Groove mm -hmm. and what happened back in the day. They've left a lot of the story out. So I feel, you know, as I was an in integral part of uh, the scene and bringing the music mm -hmm. to life, I was just one of many, but yeah. I, I feel that there is so much more that hasn't been told, which is one of the reasons I'm doing mm -hmm. this documentary, not, not as a commercial uh, project, but simply, you know, for the, first of all, for the love of the music and secondly to document it and thirdly also because there's another generation that's coming up mm -hmm. and I just feel that they need to know how special this music is and the yeah. origins of it yeah. and the people who are there experiencing it back in the clubs and on the dance floor. So no, absolutely. I mean the important thing for young people to realise 
that there was a time when not everything was led by marketing. There was a time where things were made and existed that marketing then promoted. That is a key difference, yeah, for me. You know, Rear Groove, it, 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 as we talk about it as an all-encompassing, if you want to give it that, Rear Groove was not something that people strive to create Rear Groove. It was a creation of people who were black, who wanted to create music that elevated us. And it just so happened that a number of people were into it, followed it, emulated it, winded it, and it went to the world and became what we call Rear Groove. It wasn't created to be Rear Groove. It was created because people organically created music that represented them and gave them identity. That's why. But so from a from a sort of humanitarian point of view, mm -hmm. um, for me, it's music that resonates in a very, very particular way. Mm -hmm. And getting to the essence of that and talking to the people who were there, the people who created it, mm -hmm. is important to me. So thanks for taking time to yeah. uh, come out of the dance floor. And uh, it's cold out here, and I know that uh, you want to get back to those vibes. So, <laughs> Listen, it's my pleasure. I just wanted to not set the record straight, but set the record from a point of view not heard so far. I thank you very much for doing that.